Good morning, everyone. I think you can do better. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Excellent. I am so thrilled to have everyone here, and I just want to say a hearty welcome to the White House. We are so honored to have you join us for today's White House convening on equity. I want to really open today's remarks or open today's event by celebrating the historic moment that this convening represents as we commer commemorate the one-year anniversary of the signing of the President's second executive order on equity. And the reason why the President signed a second executive order on equity is because uh, equity is a cornerstone issue from, for this administration. Not only did we have a day one EO that was really designed to drive agencies, but our second EO was really designed to create the infrastructure within agencies to drive uh, equity across the board. So today, we are bringing together 100 equity and racial justice leaders from communities across the country with equity leaders from across the federal government, including the fantastic members of the cabinet we have here. And I just want to say, looking out at all of you, I see a room that truly represents the best of America. So I do want to say, on behalf of the White House and the Domestic Policy Council, just a hearty, hearty thank you for the fantastic work. And I want to say thanks to the tireless advocacy of so many people here and in communities across the country, advising leaders in the federal government, we have uh, phenomenal ideas of how to advance equity for all, including communities that have long been underserved. And our work here is fundamentally ab about addressing systemic racism and systemic inequities across the federal government. So people often ask, what is equity? What, is, what does this issue mean? And I know it's become a bit loaded because we have some criticism uh, from the far right on these issues. So I just want to be really clear what equity is about. Equity is about a very simple idea, which is providing everyone with the opportunity to reach their full potential and to remove the structural barriers in, in, and inequities that hold people back. We know more than ever that there are structural barriers to hold people back. And while it can be, uh, while it can be a little bit of a, a political hot potato, fundamentally, this is about a very basic American principle, which is fairness. So that is why we are here today, because equity, this, this principle is so important. And I, I explain it this way. When mothers who are black or Native American or mothers who live in rural communities have to worry about whether they themselves will survive during childbirth, we know we have a lot more work to do because we know that black mothers, Native American mothers, rural mothers are disproportionately impacted or disproportionately affected, disproportionately die during birth. That is outrageous. When a Latino family has to take down their family photos before putting their home up for sale because they think they know if they put those photos up, they'll be paid less money for their house. That is a barrier we need to take down. Why? Because it's simply unfair. When Native communities, U.S. territories, and communities impacted by poverty are on the front lines of our climate crisis but lack the investments in their communities, we know we have a lot more work to do. So advancing equity means putting these real stories at the heart of our policy and solving these problems, following data and evidence to identify ongoing injustices, and partnering with communities to tackle the barriers that American families still face. Since day one, the Biden-Harris administration has championed an ambitious equity and racial justice agenda to ensure the full and fair participation of all our communities in the work of our government and in American life. That is just the basic principle we're all about. 
Since day one, we recognize that the reality that numerous programs in the federal government have historically underserved particular communities, including rural communities, communities of color, tribal communities, LGBTQ plus communities, religious minorities, people with disabilities, women and girls, and communities impacted persistent po by persistent poverty. So this is really about a vision that means everyone in the federal government is fairly served. Research has demonstrated time and time again that re redressing these opportunity graphs, gra gaps will drive stronger economic growth for all of us. Those forces that want to make everything a zero-sum game are simply wrong. In fact, research from the Federal Reserve's 12th District finds that the gaps of opportunity for women and people of color cost the U.S. Two point, the U.S. the U.S. national economy. $2.6 trillion in foregone GDP in 2019. These gaps were closed, if, if these gaps were closed, it's estimated that economic output would increase by an additional $3.1 trillion in 2029. That just means when we make sure everyone is part of, our, is part of opportunity, we all do better. That is why the Biden-Harris administration has issued these two historic executive orders and is driving equitable implementation of the President's landmark Investing in America agenda and other key legislation. We are focused on increasing economic and social mobility and making real the promise of America for everyone. As I said, we all do better when we all do better. It is my incredible honor that we share that to share that all cabinet level agencies and a total of 23 large agencies are releasing their annual equity action plans, which include over 100 strategies and actions that will be implemented this year to address systemic barriers in the nation's policies and programs. Let me say that again, 100 strategies. So let's give a round of applause for that. Agencies are taking action to promote fairness in the housing market, address gender-based workforce discrimination, ensure health equity, and access for LGBTQ plus Americans, expand contracting opportunities for veterans, and expand safe and accessible transportation for people with disabilities. Today, the Biden-Harris administration will also release a new White House Equity Action Plan Progress Report, which highlights examples of more than six 150 actions agencies has, um, have undertaken since the release of our 2022 action plans. These new equity plans incorporate input and expertise from community organizers, equity researchers, racial justice advocates, people across the country committed to ensuring that we are making progress for all, all Americans. As you all understand so well, equity is the heart of the, a success for us as a nation. For many of you joining us today and listening or watching online, advancing equity has been your life's work and we are really grateful for your leadership. So let me just quickly provide a overview of today. This morning we are fortunate to have Congressman Horsford, Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, a phenomenal leader who will share opening remarks and then we will have two panels, first an equity, one on equity in action and I am just incredibly privileged to, to be uh, chairing the first session, which has HUD Secretary Marcia Fudge, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona, Department of Interior Secretary Deb Holland, and Small Business Administrator Isabel Guzman, who are incredible leaders and drivers in their agencies to ensure that we, uh, that all, that equity is at the heart of what their agencies do. And then, Later, we're, we'll have a panel led by Mayor Steve Benjamin um, on partnering with communities, which will also have uh, EPA Deputy Administrator, uh, Administrator Janet McCabe and Department of Commerce Secretary, Se Secretary Don Graves, uh, Veterans Affairs Deputy Secretary Tanya Bradshaw, as well as Department of Transportation Under Secretary Carlos Monier. So we, before we jump to the first panel, I wanted to say a few more words. First, I want to acknowledge former Secretary of Transportation in the Obama-Biden administration, Anthony Fox. Where's Anthony? Mm. Now we're going to really get him that he's not here. That's a, that's a, I, well, he'll be, he won't be living that down easily. 
And uh, I w wanna invite uh, my colleague, Nani Coloretti. But before I do, I just really wanna say that um, I am really privileged to chair the Domestic Policy Council. This work is really vital to the work we do, and it is vital to the work we do because both the president and the vice president keep us on our toes on these issues. Uh, he knows, uh, and they both know, that um, this is this work is why they are in public service. This work is why we are all here to serve, and it is really the highest calling of the Domestic Policy Council and the White House to ensure that this government truly works for all Americans. We all do better when we all do better. And now it is my uh, real pleasure to welcome Nani Coloretti, Deputy Director of the White House Office of Management Budget and one of the key offices integral to ensuring the success of the Biden-Harris administration work on equity. Nani? Good morning. Thank you, Nira, for that really great introduction and for reminding us why we're all here today, why we do this hard work every day. Um, I'm just honored to be here. I see a lot of colleagues, past and present, who are in the uh, in the work with us and in the in the challenges with us and 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 also the opportunities. So I've heard President Biden speak many times about the need to reach communities in every corner of America, including and especially those that have been left behind. And this administration has acted accordingly. That's why, for example, we see, we've seen black and brown unemployment rates near historic lows. And this is the result of the president's leadership. And the Office of Management and Budget, OMB as we call it, is here to ensure that the equity work gets done across the whole of government. And as Nira said just a few moments ago, make sure that everyone is fairly served by your government. So I want to highlight just a few key ways that OMB is Im implementing the Biden-Harris agenda to advance equity. So first, we're leveraging federal procurement. This is how we buy things, right? So the federal government is the largest buyer of goods and services in the world. And the president made a historic goal for small disadvantaged businesses to be awarded 15% of federal contract dollars by 2025, and OMB is helping deliver on that promise. In each of the last three fiscal years, the administration has increased spending on contracts to small businesses, with small businesses receiving nearly $163 billion in federal contracting in FY 2022, so that's just in one year alone. $70 billion of that was awarded to small disadvantaged businesses. And our data shows that businesses owned by historically underrepresented groups earned more through federal contracts across every category. So that is really um, a great thing to think about in terms of how we're changing the economy. Under President Biden, a record 16 million new business applications for small businesses have been filed. The share of black households owning a small business has more than doubled. And the share of Latino households, Latino Hispanic households owning a business has increased by 40% under this president. So these figures underscore the administration's unwavering and continuing commitment to underserved entrepreneurs and small business owners. The second thing we're doing is we're reimagining how we serve the public. Navigating federal services that you need can be confusing and stressful. And it's often those who need services the most who have the hardest time accessing them. And so this administration is fixing that. In 2022, we designated five key life experiences where the public interacts with multiple government agencies. And I'll just say what these are so you know what we're working on. Approaching retirement, facing a financial shock, recovering from a disaster, having a child, and transitioning from active duty military service to civilian life. Under OMB's leadership, agencies spent months conducting research with communities and developing pilots to address these pain points that people have identified. And these pilots have had multiple impacts, and I'll just tell you about one of them. This is a really great example. Millions of children didn't lose health care coverage uh, during the COVID public health emergency unwinding. So when the public health emergency ended, uh, 
states were needing to reauthorize people's eligibility for Medicaid, and this is a very onerous process and each state does it differently. Instead of people having to apply for this renewal manually, a significant barrier, um, we partnered directly with eight states to fix eligibility systems to increase the number of people who are automatically renewed for benefits using existing data. So this is over two million people who were not losing their health care coverage because of this project. And lastly, OMB is helping develop, deliver on environmental justice. So the president made a commitment through the Justice 40 initiative to deliver 40 percent of the overall benefits of certain climate, clean energy, and other federal investments to disadvantaged communities that are marginally overburdened by pollution. Since making this commitment, over 500 programs across 19 federal agencies have been identified as covered under the Justice 40 initiative. Many of these programs are new programs created by the Inflation Reduction Act and by the bipartisan infrastructure law that will mean real investments for frontline communities. And last year, just a few months ago, we announced that 74 additional programs under the Inflation Reduction Act will be covered by this program. That's representing over $118 billion in collective federal funding that will maximize benefits to disadvantaged communities. And that's on top of the other programs that are funded by this law and by general appropriations. Um, so I'll share just one example. Through the President's Inflation Reduction Act, the EPA will deliver $2 billion for new environmental and climate justice grants. That's the single largest investment dedicated to environmental justice in the agency's history. And so this is really about changing the way we do our work, but also making this the way we do our business. And you all know that this work is not easy. It's the right thing to do, and we're here to fulfill the commitment. OMB will continue to make sure equity is the focus of every agency, and that equity is baked into the way that government does business. So today's equity action plans, and I encourage you all to go on the web and look at them. They're really, really incredible. I have spent some time seeing what all of the agencies are doing and what they're promising to do. These plans bring us closer to an America where everyone can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. So thank you for your partnership and for holding us accountable to deliver equitable results for all. Okay, so now it's my great honor to introduce uh, and welcome uh, Congressman Steve Horsford, who is the who is from the great straight state of uh, Nevada and uh, is chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. And let me just say one uh, quick story about Congressman Horsford. Um, I met him about over a decade ago. Uh, Senator Reid, the great leader, uh, great majority leader. I uh, used to have a convening in every August in uh, Las Vegas around the potential of climate action to create industries like the solar industry renewables. He started this visionary work actually in the early 2000s. And as president of the Center for American Progress, we were a co-convener. And so I went out every August. And uh, over a decade ago, Senator Harry Reid introduced me to uh, a, a guy named Steve Horsford, uh, who I believe was running or had just become a member. I'm so sorry, I forget. But he, uh, I, when I first met him, he was talking about how we could create solar jobs in Las Vegas in his district to redress some of the historic inequities that places like Las Vegas, communities like his, who had not been part of uh, new transition opportunities. Really, how could we think creatively about bringing those jobs to his district? It is really the core thinking and strategy that is so important and so critical, and I'm so grateful for him to be here today because he is a visionary, strategic leader who makes progress every day. Thank you, Congressman. Good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you very much for that overly generous uh, introduction, Nira. And I want to commend you and the entire Domestic Policy Council uh, for your work and for advancing 
equity and inclusion for all communities. I know it's at the heart of uh, this administration's work and the legacy that President Biden and Vice President Harris uh, have said they will deliver and are delivering for all of our constituents. Uh, I am Representative Stephen Horsford. I'm proud to represent Nevada's fourth congressional district. My district covers 50,000 square miles throughout Nevada. I have Las Vegas and North Las Vegas, five tribal nations, uh, rural communities that are very underserved. Um, my district is demographically and geographically diverse, uh, and we look like America and what America will continue to become. And so it's really an honor to be here, uh, and I want to first thank President Biden and Vice President Harris for their tremendous leadership and commitment to improving racial equity in the federal government. Since day one of this administration, they've made this a commitment, and not only from within the government and the whole of government, but for what it means every day in our, uh, the lives of our communities and the people that we serve. I have to give a special shout out uh, to Secretary Marsha Fudge, uh, who's the former uh, a colleague of mine. <laughs> Secretary Cardona, uh, Secretary Holland, and Administrator Guzman, each one of these leaders are advancing equity and inclusion, and I've worked with each of them, and I've seen the commitment that you bring to this work, and I just want to say thank you. I know that federal service is not easy. Uh, I, I, tell, I tell people all the time, I actually don't work for the federal government. <laughs> I work for 700,000 people who elected me to do a job, and that is to be their voice here in, in Congress. But all of you who play a role, um, whether within government, uh, within the space of racial equity and justice, I want to commend you for your work first and foremost. Now, since President Biden and Vice President Harris entered office, the administration, the Democratic Caucus under leader Hakeem Jeffries, and a strong and unified Congressional Black Caucus have committed to doing all that we can to improving racial equity and expanding opportunities to underserved communities. Today, the Congressional Black Caucus has the largest membership in our history at 60. Collectively, our members represent 120 million Americans, a third of the U.S. population, about 20 million black Americans. We represent everybody. Our districts are diverse. Um, and while we advance the priorities of black America, we're fighting to improve the lives of all Americans. Over the past several years, Together, we have delivered historic results, um, including during the 117th Congress, where we created record levels of well-paying jobs. We delivered a record 50-year low black unemployment rate, brought down inflation, and ensured that communities that were disproportionately impacted during the pandemic were not left behind in the vaccine and economic recovery efforts. Together, we passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the first law to address the collateral effects of climate change on communities of color. Removed, <laughs> removed lead-free pipes, uh, in, uh, excuse me, removed lead pipes to ensure that children were not contaminated and provided funding for access to high-speed broadband in every state in America. Together, we passed the Historic Chips and Science Act, which included provisions to improve diversity in STEM fields. We passed the Historic Inflation Reduction Act to lower families' kitchen table costs, to create jobs, and to deliver the most significant action on climate in the history of the world, and providing resources for communities to create new green energy projects. You're right. Nira, when we were in Las Vegas during those forums, we talked about the future. Well, the future is here when it comes to renewables and a clean, green energy economy. And what Senator Reid and I and others had a vision for was that communities that were historically left out of these sectors in the past, traditionally, would actually be included because we would be intentional about making sure that they had the job training and the opportunities for entrepreneurship in these new fields. 
The investment that you just talked about of $118 billion in the Justice 40 projects, that's creating wealth and opportunities in communities all across our country. And together, we passed the most significant piece of gun reform legislation in nearly 30 years with the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Now, these are just a few of the steps that we've all taken to address some of the systemic barriers facing all of our communities. But we're not finished. We know that there's more work to do, and that's why we are committed to continuing our efforts, and this convening is so important. Again, I want to recognize all of you who are involved in this work of advancing equity and creating opportunities and addressing the systemic barriers who, that have prevented some communities from fully participating or reaching their potential. While you're working to move us forward, there are those who are trying to move us backward. And we have to call out the thing that's, that is the thing. Um, and as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, I have no problem of doing that. So as we mark one year since President Biden signed the executive order on advancing racial equity, I really am more hopeful than ever that we can expand on our shared record of accomplishment. Now, last summer, in the wake of the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, the Congressional Black Caucus, through the Congressional Black, In Congressional Black Caucus Institute, we got out of Washington, D.C., and we led a 14-city Democracy for the People summer of action. We went into our communities. We did town halls and um, youth forums and organizing sessions to hear directly from our constituents. Uh, I also want to recognize Nicole Austin Hillary, who is our uh, Chief Executive Officer and President of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, which leads the National Racial Equity Initiative at the Foundation, who is here today. <laughs> These efforts that we are undertaking are all about ensuring that we lift up the voices of our constituents, who are concerned about the issues that are most important to them, and to learn what they can do to help improve their own lives and access the opportunities that this administration is helping to create. Now, we know that addressing the inequities plaguing communities of color require conscious policy and decision-making from the top down. As the attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion have intensified since the SCOTUS decision, We've seen conservative actors like Ed Blum, Stephen Miller, and others who wish to see us less free and with fewer opportunities of advancement. While you're working to create opportunities, there are some who are working to take it away. And, I, and, and, and especially, it insults me when they're trying to take away economic opportunity. Because that's the very thing that helps people move forward in the economic ladder. These are nothing but tools to achieve equity and parity because of systemic racism and discrimination that we've faced over time. Now, we have not done this work alone. The CBC has been working to hold the line against these attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as the 8A certification program and the lawsuits against the venture capital firms. But we're doing it in alignment with the tri-caucus chairs, the Congressional Hispanic, and Congressional Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus, because we understand an attack on one of our communities is an attack on all of our communities, and we will not be silenced in this moment. Now, since the ruling, more than a dozen conservative attorney generals have issued letters to Fortune 500 companies threatening legal action over their DEI efforts. Organizations like the Fearless Fund that provide seed capital to black women-owned businesses have come under attack. We are witnessing an all-out assault on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as the conscience of the Congress, we cannot and we will not sit back and allow this to happen. So this past December, the Congressional Black Caucus issued a letter to Fortune 500 corporations who made public racial equity and DEI commitments prior to and since the summer of 2020 and the death of George Floyd, 
urging them to stand firm to their commitments in the face of these attacks. And we commend those companies who have affirmed their commitment to continue to focus on diversity as a business and talent imperative and to make sure that we are working together in our shared goals of economic prosperity and wealth building for everyone. One of the most powerful tools that we have is the power of example. And Pre President Biden and Vice President Harris are leading by example. By taking this comprehensive approach to addressing ad and advancing equity across the federal government, and by addressing systemic racism in our federal policies and programs, we can make the government better, and we can serve all of our communities, and we can send a message to those who want to roll back our progress. We won't let that happen on our watch. So again, I commend President Biden and Vice President Harris for continuing to build on their commitment to racial equity and, and justice, and we look forward to working together in the months and years to come to dismantle barriers and to create opportunities because we believe in a future where everyone can thrive and achieve their full potential. Thank you for your work. Good morning. My name is Jenny Yang, our Deputy Assistant to the President for Racial Justice and Equity. And it is such an honor to be here with all of you for our 2024 White House Equity Convening. Thank you, Congressman Horsford, for sharing the ways in which the federal government is working to advance equity and serve all of our communities. I'd like to uh, now welcome our first panel discussion on equity in action. Our director of the Domestic Policy Council, Nira Tandon, will chair that discussion. And I would like to now call our cabinet members who are leading the way in our whole of government work to advance equity. Secretary. We are honored to have Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marsha Fudge, Secretary of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, and Administrator of the Small Business Administration, Isabel Guzman. Thank you all today. Good morning. Excellent. They're like, we got it this time. Uh, I am uh, so grateful to be here with uh, you, um, this pheno uh, phenomenal members of our cabinet, who've been uh, really leading in this critical work. So uh, I'm just going to start start with a basic question, which is, and I'll start with you, Secretary Fudge, which is, if you, it, it would be fantastic if you could just give us a sense of what your uh, what HUD is doing and why you think this work is important. Thank you so much. Uh, let me tell you why I think it's important, and I hope that you understand this, this story. My grandmother was a domestic until the day she died. My mother is a labor organizer, retired 20 years. This is what I know. This is what I live every day. And I, who have been given so much more than they ever had, it's the very least I could do. I mean, people look at your life and think it's all been easy, but I have been counted out so many times, underestimated so many times. So this is what I do. Uh, and even if the president and vice president had not made it a priority, it would have been a priority with me anyway. A lot of people talk about equity. They talk about diversity. Half the people don't even know what they are talking about. Uh, so people talk it. I just want you to know HUD walks it. Yes, every single yes, day. Yes. We, we talked about procurement. The president wanted us at 15% black, brown, and disadvantaged. We're over 20 and growing every single day. Uh, so we are here to make sure that people who need our help know that government can help them and not ignore them. So I know that we have other questions and I can get into specifics, but this is why I do this work. It is my life's work. It is personal with me. 
fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Secretary Holland, would you like to share your thoughts? Sure. Thank you so much, Nira. Really happy to be here with my esteemed colleagues. And of course, so the Department of the Interior manages all of our public lands across the entire country, lands that belong to every single American, every single American, regardless of their zip code, regardless of where they live, regardless of what family they come from, our public lands belong to everyone. So we start there. That's a very fundamental thing. Uh, we also, uh, uh, part of our mission is also to uphold the trust and treaty responsibilities of our 574 federally recognized tribes. So, of course, th that being our mission, um, you know, if we, if we want to be um, forward thinking about who's going to steward our public lands in the future, that means we need to make sure that everybody has an opportunity uh, to visit those lands, to be inspired by those lands, to find careers in stewarding those lands. So uh, that's one of the reasons why we work very hard to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to um, to to be it, to understand what that charge is. Um, that being said, uh, we work with and we try very hard to make sure that we have a diverse. Uh, that I have diverse colleagues to work with. We, Im we have about 70,000 career staff at the Department of the Interior, and so we want those folks to bring their perspectives to work with them every single day. Uh, we're also very grateful to Interior's Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Civil Rights uh, for contributions to today's equity plan. They worked very hard on that, and we have uh, a diverse staff in that office too uh, because it's so important to make sure we, we have those perspectives uh, guiding us as we do our work every single day. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today, so proud to work for an administration who cares deeply about this issue uh, and uh, to make sure that uh, every, every place that we have that the federal government is responsible for, that it looks like America. And that's what we should do. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> Administrator Guzman. Uh, it would be great if I welcome your thoughts uh, on your approach, but also um, you've been leading at a time of change and criticism uh, c where conservatives have been critical of some of the investments. So just love to have you share your thoughts. Yeah, just on equity overall, I mean, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, you know, the accessing the American dream was through entrepreneurship in my family. And uh, I think in, you know, growing up, of course, my dad was the entrepreneur who I went to work with every day, but my mom was the advocate who went into the schools and made sure her kids, uh, you know, were treated fairly and were always advocating. And she always spoke up on behalf of others and taught me to speak up on behalf of others. And so uh, for me, uh, joining this administration, uh, focused on equity focused in on delivering the American dream of business ownership to more Americans just hit the sweet spot for me. I could advocate and fight for change in this country so that more people could access that dream and really build generational wealth that has been denied for far too long. And uh, I'm just uh, you know, excited to be here because for me, you know, equity means that our economy advances, equity means that we can be more globally competitive, that we empower all of our businesses to create jobs uh, for their communities and really define their neighborhoods and bring pride uh, in the sense of community. So, uh, you know, the work of equity to me is very personal, uh, coming from uh, specifically the small business angle and the entrepreneurship angle. And you know, it's why I joined this administration of really trying to deliver for everyone uh, that access to opportunity and especially for those hopeful entrepreneurs that really you know, bring us uh, you know, great success in this country. Great, thank you. And, and Secretary Cardona, uh, obviously uh, issues of economic mobility, social mobility, really start with our education system. So just welcome your views you. on, on, on issue, on uh, your approach overall to equity. First of all, happy Valentine's Day. It is Valentine's Day. <laughs> Look, 
I'm a, I'm a, the longest job I've ever held was a school principal, so I think like a principal. I appreciate those of you that found red to wear today. Uh, <laughs> happy Valentine's Day, and at a time in 2024, when uh, where in many parts of our country equity is a bad word, where we have folks who are fighting DEI intently, we must be unapologetic about what we're doing to fight to make sure that everyone has opportunity. Uh, sometimes we hear the loudest voices uh, coming from those who want to break it down. We need to be loud and make sure that what we're talking about is advancing uh, our country's uh, goals. Um, you know, at a time where uh, when I went to do a commencement speech, I had a, uh, a leader of a university tell me we had to scrub the word equity from your bio because it could create problems. We must, must recognize that um, we are at a, at a time in our country's history where we have to fight and we have to fight loudly. And that you know, the only thing I would change about that sign is put the word American equity. We are American, and this is American equity. I always say I'm as American as apple pie and rice and beans. <laughs> Get used to it, damn it. All right. And I, I also want to say, um, you know, I, I wanted to defer my time to, to, to Siobhan Arlene Bradley because have you ever heard her speak? Man, it's inspiring. Good to see you. We, we were able to spend some time together at Ebenezer Baptist Church on Martin Luther King Day, one of the most impactful days of my life. You were the keynote speaker, and it was, to me, it's just what an honor to serve as Secretary of Education at this time in our country's history. And I, and I say, you know, we do this work, and in education, there's not something that we do that's not uh, part of our equity initiative, because education is equity in this country. But I want to give a special shout out to the folks from the White House Initiative. I know many of them are here. Please stand or raise your hand. Um, they are, many of them are housed at the Department of Education. They are doing amazing work. Um, and, you know, in education, we could talk about college affordability and accessibility uh, from the lens of equity. We could talk about the work that we did to push back on states to make sure that they maintain maintenance of equity efforts. And I'm all states, red and blue states, we cannot lower funding in education because we have normalized gaps in achievement uh, in our country ever since we've been collecting data. You know, what we, what we often refer to as what Dr. Pedro Nogueira called the normalization of failure. We are boldly addressing that and unapologetically addressing that. Or whether we're talking about uh, supporting our uh, justice uh, impacted individuals um, or talking about the mental health needs of our students. Everything that we do at the Department of Education must be seen through an equity lens. So while you'll see priorities in the Education Department on these plans, there's nothing that we do that doesn't have that lens on it because our job in education is to level the playing field to make sure that our country reaches its potential. So really happy to be here and really, to, I mean, you're doing the work. You know, you're, we're in this together, so while we could talk about our specific departments, we know that um, it, it really does take a village, and you're just as much a part of the village as we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Secretary Fudge, I, I, if I'd ask you if you could just share some of the highlights of the work that HUD has been doing. I totally hear you that it is, and I can attest, it is part and parcel of the fabric of your leadership of HUD to drive this across the board, but there are additional actions that HUD has taken um, to, uh, to meet the President's equity goals. We'd just love to have you share them with the group. I was fortunate to accompany the President to Tulsa when most of this was announced. Yeah. Uh, and so we talked about uh, PAVE, which is a, a, a task force that I chair, actually, at the President's request, to deal with appraisal bias in this country. You should not be low-balled or black-balled because you live in a brown or black community. We lose a significant value in our properties every single year. I will tell you my own story. I live in an all-black community by choice. I live two doors from an all-white community. I have a bigger lot than the house two doors from me. I have a bigger house than the house two doors from me. And in my opinion, a better house than the house two doors from me. <laughs> But my house is valued at $25,000 less than the house two doors for me. I live it every day. So we are fighting that battle. We are bringing more and more um, fair housing lawsuits than have ever been brought. Our fair housing people know that it is the law of the land. And as a recovering lawyer, I enforce the law. 
Uh, secondly, we have done things to make home buying more, uh, more affordable and easier. We had a system when we came that was very anti people who wanted to get an education because we would give them less credit because they had student loan debt. So we would punish them for bettering themselves. That has changed. We no longer value it the same way we did when we came and now more and more people are buying homes. We had over one and a half million new home buyers over the last three years, even in a down economy. Uh, we saved 160,000 black and brown homes uh, over the last, during the pandemic because people were at risk, obviously, of foreclosure. We are the people who actually have five million people who we give rental assistance to every single month. Um, we have as well changed, or we're in the process of changing how we deal with criminal records. People come out of prison and they cannot live with their families if they live in public housing. That's going to stop. You can't just automatically say that someone can't live there. You have to look at their background and their record. Because otherwise what we do is we, we contribute to the recidivism rates of, that we find in this country. And lastly and more importantly, we have a, rip, a MIP um, reduction. So it's at minimum $800 off of your mortgage because we reduced the mortgage insurance premiums. Uh, we're doing a whole lot of things. Um, we deal with healthy homes. You talked about lead, it, is, it comes through us. Disaster recovery comes from, comes from us. Uh, and more black and brown communities are harmed by storms than you would think. We are the bulk of the people who are harmed by storms. So we're looking at um, every manner of way that people live, but I would say this in closing. So many of the people that we represent were born really behind the starting line of life. It is our responsibility to give them a chance not only just at home ownership, but just to live decent. We, we are a nation that does not value uh, people that are poor or black or brown. And that is why I'm so pleased to work in this administration because we do. So I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Secretary Fudge. I really, I think that encapsulates the entire day. Uh, which is, you know, essentially giving people a chance is essentially what this, all of this work is about. So, Secretary Holland, um, if you could just give us, uh, share also just some highlights from the work, uh, you, uh, further highlights of the work that the Department of Interior is doing um, to address equity. Uh, and I know there's historically been a difference between the use of our national parks by communities of color uh, versus white communities. So just touch on any of those issues as well. Thank you, Nira. Uh, bear with me. I, I've written my response out because I don't want to forget anything uh, because we do so much. Um, thank you, Secretary Fudge. I'm so honored to serve alongside you. Um, so in three years, we've made big, challenging, and transformative accomplishments, which we're very, very proud of in addressing all of the barriers to equity across the department's jurisdiction. And I mentioned what our jurisdiction was in the first question. The example I wanna to share today is one that's near and dear to my heart, our work to remedy decades of underfunding across Indian country by harnessing the purchasing power of the federal government. The Buy Indian Act is one of our best tools for empowering native owned businesses as federal contractors. Passed over a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, this law gives the department the authority to set aside procurement contracts for Indian owned and controlled businesses, eliminating certain barriers that might otherwise disqualify these businesses from federal contracts. The thoughtful implementation of this essential law means that we aren't just advancing our mission, but that we're doing so while empowering and uplifting native businesses. In 2022, we announced new regulations to improve implementation of the Buy Indian Act and promote meaningful economic development opportunities for business owners and entrepreneurs across Indian country. Through a new web resource, employees, tribes, and the public can now access training and stakeholder engagement opportunities and obtain information for Native American-owned businesses, providing an easily accessible way to identify and enhance the use of indigenous vendors for federal contract opportunities. 
Our department has also launched other initiatives like the Buy Indian Act online training course, which was completed by over 2,000 Interior employees in 2023. But we're not just focused on expanding visibility for Native-owned businesses, we're also using the power of the federal purse. Last year, Interior's bureaus awarded over $1.4 billion to Native-owned businesses with Indian Affairs bureaus awarding more than, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Awarding more than 70% of eligible contract funds to Native business owners. This is significant progress and an important demonstration of our commitment to removing barriers for Native American businesses. As we advance this work, we're committed to bringing every partner into the fold. Last year, the department held the first only by Indian Industry Day with our partners at the Department of Health and Human Services. The event drew more than 152 non-federal attendees and facil facilitated nearly 700 meetings between vendors and federal buyers. Getting folks together, that's incredibly important. As a result of this outstanding work, the department's Indian Affairs teams were awarded the 2023 Chief Acquisition Officers Council Small Business and Procurement Equity Excellence Award. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Uh, this award from the Office of Management and Budget highlights our team's incredible dedication to advancing the diversity of our supplier base while maintaining the sound contracting stewardship principles that support historically disadvantaged communities like Indian Country. I'm so proud of our team's historic efforts and I know that this work will have positive ripple effects throughout our communities for many years. These e efforts represent the Interior Department's commitment to Indian Country and the Biden-Harris administration's emphasis on promoting opportunities for small and disadvantaged businesses while creating new jobs. So um, at, at the White, and I'll say one last thing, at the 2023 White House Tribal Nations Summit, President Biden signed a new executive order to reform how agencies develop budgets and spend funding for Indian country, and this type of leadership and direction was a very big deal. So basically, we want to do things by Indian country, for Indian country, that's our job, and we're very proud to have an administration that supports all the work um, that we feel passionate about. Thank you so much, Secretary Holland. Uh, can I turn to you, Administrator Guzman, if you could just give a few top lines about the work that the SBA is doing to address equity? Well, you know, the President likes to describe uh, every single entrepreneur as, uh, and that act of starting a small business as an act of hope. And it truly is, in, in terms of their, you know, strong faith and belief in, in opportunity in the marketplace. And, you know, uh, what he was concerned about when he first, uh, the very first day he talked to me, as well as the vice president, was, you know, that as small businesses were trying to survive the pandemic and uh, and succeed to to thrive again, uh, you know, they were not treated equally. There were barriers and uh, lack of access to some of those early rounds of COVID relief at the SBA in particular. Uh, and so the SBA, of course, you know, scaled to deliver $500 billion in the president's first year to, uh, to, believe, to deliver on that equity, to make sure that we were inclusive of entrepreneurs that were left out of early rounds of relief. And uh, truly, we've led the agency from that perspective going forward. Um, how do we ensure that we're matching that hope uh, with opportunity in the marketplace and with capital to fund growth, to fund job creation in this country? And I'll start with the capital, because that's what SBA is most known for. We, you know, last year we put out $52 billion, a record high across our portfolio. Uh, I think less people know that not only do we do loans, about $34 billion every single year, uh, but we also do investment capital. Uh, and, and as well, you know, that's, that's $4 billion in government funding matched with $4 billion in private funding, uh, which then is syndicated with loans all around that to those businesses, another $10 billion. Uh, we also do about $7 billion in bonding. We do $3 billion in disaster assistance, not only to the businesses, uh, but to their employees and customers by helping homeowners and renters recover from a disaster. 
So we really um, you know, take seriously our ability to put out that capital equitably across our portfolio of programs because that's matching that hope with actual opportunity. And it's uh, unfair in this country that we challenge our diverse founders who are starting businesses at the highest rates. You heard the numbers, but uh, you know, doubling of the black households with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, as well as seeing increases across uh, Latino founders as well, the highest in 10 years, the highest in the black community in 30 years. Uh, but we, you know, we know that uh, uh, they're having to compete uh, at a disadvantage, paying higher rates for their capital or not even being able to access capital. And that's how uh, the disparity comes into play that hurts our economy because they're not creating the jobs or producing the output that they could uh, and lifting up this economy. So our capital reforms went to straight and center on simplicity. Small businesses owners went simple, um, expanding uh, eligibility and simplifying underwriting that has uh, boxed out so many of our communities, uh, including significant criminal justice reforms that opened up our program, period, to anybody uh, that has been impacted by the criminal justice system. It doesn't matter if you're on parole. It doesn't matter if you had any criminal record. We don't ask. No more box. Um, and we, you know, we, we did all these programs intentionally. And after these significant reforms, the biggest changes in more than 40 years, uh, you know, we've seen an uptick in startup capital and small dollar they're lending. We've doubled the number of loans in the in the Biden Harris administration now to uh, 1.5 billion dollars to Black entrepreneurs last year. We saw similar increases across uh, our underserved markets, and so uh, we know the changes are important. And most significantly, and I'll uh, I'll say is that in line with the whole administration's priority on competition. Uh, we created competition by diversifying our mm -hmm. base of lenders. We need our lenders uh, as well to look like the people who are starting businesses in this country, and that's women and people of color. Uh, and we're doing it on our investment portfolio. In fact, convening at the White House today uh, with diverse investing uh, investors who are coming into our program as a result of our changes uh, so that the check writers look like the businesses who are starting. Uh, and so those reforms have been really transformational in spurring entrepreneurship and seeing that incredible growth and I've met multiple entrepreneurs who just during the Biden administration have been able to access a loan to start their businesses, uh, you know, founders who were left out of uh, resources for too long. Uh, but the opportunity is the other really critical thing that a lot of us work on uh, in this, uh, in the government as well. And that's the whole of government approach that Biden has uh, instituted around equity in procurement. Uh, and you heard the numbers as well on that, you know, 70 billion of the 160 to 3 billion that went to small businesses, went to small disadvantaged businesses, marching towards the president's goal of 15% to small disadvantaged businesses by 2025. You know, the federal marketplace is nearly $700 billion dollars in opportunity uh, to small businesses and we need to make significant changes in order to power our small businesses uh, that means you know driving down um, our, our strategies with OMB to provide you know small entry contracts for our small businesses as an example so they can get the performance experience uh, and ensuring that the agency leaders uh, are tracking performance and seeing these climbs that like at HUD uh, you know VA DOI and others who are taking this seriously and really driving change. Uh, and you know, specifically on the Ultima case around the 8A program, attacking the very core of the small disadvantaged business goal in this country. Uh, obviously, it's still an open live case pending final judgment. Uh, but we have worked vigorously to ensure that not a single 8A contract has been lost from this program, which was uh, a gargantuan feat uh, at a time when we were at the end of year spending. And you know that um, that meant we saw a bump in in the disaggregated data as well, with you know more than 440 million dollars more to Black entrepreneurs uh, in our federal spend, and a, you know a third of a billion dollars more to uh, Latino spend. So we know that uh, our efforts to protect these programs, to continue to uh, recruit and retain contractors, is working. Uh, and that's the leadership that you see in the Biden-Harris administration. So I'm, I'm positive that hope and opportunity and capital are matched in this administration and we'll continue to fight for more. Thank you so much, uh, Administrator Guzman. I do think it's just always important to remember how much uh, wealth building is important. And as we know, um, communities of color have been, not been denied because of 
the laws of our government, access to wealth building, whether it's from housing values or other strategies that is really denied it. So when you face attacks in the court, it's important to remember that these policies are about redress of federal government actions themselves. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Secretary Card Cardona, to just speak uh, with, a f uh, give us a few more details about what the department is doing. Uh, I know it's the case that it's across everything, but just some specific actions the department has taken would be great. Absolutely, thank you. And you know, I love hearing my colleagues. And you know, it's really inspiring to, to listen. Um, you know, but the key word for me is intentionality. I talked about it before. And it starts with the president and vice president that were intentional to get a cabinet that looks like America. That's the bottom line. So for us, this is an extension of our life's purpose. This is not a job. We believe it. This is, this is what we've done our whole lives. So it's awesome to hear um, examples from the different agencies. And I know, you know, if we picked any other cabinet member to sit up here, you'll hear another list of things that are amazing. Um, and I'm conscious of our time, so I want to share... You know, just briefly, look, the first month or two as president with the American Rescue Plan and the Education Department, it was clear equity was going to be how we do business. We pushed back on states' recovery plans because equity wasn't deep enough in it. So the distribution of $130 billion to get our schools open, to make sure that we're addressing the disparities that were made worse by the pandemic, we had that lens on. We made sure the $40 billion that went to colleges that we knew um, needed that, those dollars to stay open. Um, you know, there are some, so many of our schools, you know, I'm thinking about HBCUs in particular, that don't have the billions in endowment and if it weren't for those American Rescue Plan dollars and those HERF dollars, those schools may not have been able to stay open. So there was an intentionality there about addressing uh, equity in our country. Then you, you, know, you flip forward and, and you think about the work that we're doing around debt forgiveness and around college affordability and accessibility. You know, everyone knows about the $137 billion in debt relief that we've provided. Everyone knows that we've gone after those colleges that are preying on first-generation students, leaving them with debt with very little credential. But we also introduced a SAFE plan, which will cut undergraduate uh, loan repayment in half. Um, we know that that's a huge deal for black and brown borrowers who owe more. <laughs> They end up owing more because of the interest accrual because they have to borrow. So we address that. We took a 40-year-old FAFSA system. It's old, you know, some of the computer systems in, at the F, FSA department are older than me. And, and with that system, we're overhauling FAFSA where 600,000 more students are going to have access, where Pell eligibility has gone up by $900 because of the president. We're going to see doors open to higher education much more. So, you know, we're, we're focusing on making sure we're disrupting a system that didn't work for everyone. Um, and we're being intentional about it. We're being unapologetic about it. Another thing, and I'll, and I'll you know, wrap with this one. We know, you know, I always say the, um, the teacher shortage issue is a symptom of a teacher respect issue in our country. Um, and I also know that if we're serious about making sure that we provide opportunities for all of our youngsters, we need to make sure, just like the president did, that our educator workforce looks like America. So there's intentionality with the Augusta Hawkins grant that was funded for the first time under this president. And, and, and I'll just tell you what I saw with it, okay? I can tell you that there's millions of dollars to increase teacher diversity, but I'll tell you, I was at Bowie State uh, two weeks ago. Any HBCU grads here? All right. Come on, a little louder. Any HBCU grads here? All right. <laughs> Bowie State had a program where I met 50 young black men who are committed to going into the teaching profession. They had mentors. They had pathways. They had internship experiences. And they had, uh, through the grant uh, from the Department of Education to increase diversity, they had their... Uh, college paid for so they could go pay it forward into their communities. That's what's happening under this administration. 
you know, I often say, Nira, I often say sometimes, you know, we get so immersed in policy and we talk in big numbers. Man, it's a beautiful thing to see faces and stories of what these policies look like. And it's happening all across America under this administration, and, and we're proud to be a part of it. Excellent. I think that is a, I think that is a, a phenomenal end. I wanted to, um, before I convene the, in this panel, I just want to say, uh, I also want to do a shout out to Siobhan uh, and also uh, to Fatima Gasgraves, who's with us today as well. And now Anthony Fox is here. Did you? I, 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 I sang your praises for a good 10 minutes earlier, and then, uh, 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 but uh, it's great to have you here. I, I want to just ask everyone in this audience to give an intense round of applause for the phenomenal leaders of this president's administration. Who are, who are making sure that every single American has a fair chance. Thank you so much. You. And I now will invite the next panel. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to move. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to join you. I'm Amber Green. I'm the special assistant to the president. For <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, I'm Amber Green. I'm the Special Assistant to the President for Racial and Economic Justice with the Domestic Policy Council. I have the privilege of leading implementation efforts of the President's executive orders alongside a wonderful team that you heard uh, shouting and clapping. And so I also want to make sure that we thank and especially thank our equity leads and all of the folks that are working alongside the administration to advance equity. So hats off to you all. I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage our next panel, and so that is going to be uh, led by Mayor Benjamin. He is the Assistant to the President and Director of the White House Office of Public Engagement. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Benjamin to the stage. Okay. Next, joining him in this discussion on equity is EPA's Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe, who has spent her career working to improve public health and protect our environment, and is one of the nation's pioneering and respected leaders on environmental justice, and uh, author of the landmark report, Toxic Waste in Race in the United States, we're joined by Ms. Vernice Miller-Travis. So would you please join us on the stage? I love seeing Amber getting that well-deserved response. I, uh, she knows I can't do that without teasing her as well. I always tell her she's the nicest person from the Bronx I've ever met. <laughs> which is, which is, uh, which is kind of true. Uh, the, um, no, but thank you, and, and thank so many of you for, um, for being here and, and the work you do, the real work that you do in the communities every single day. You're proximate uh, to the work and uh, the challenge of taking these really macro issues and making them real in the lives of people who are just, who just want a real shot. They want a real, op a real opportunity, and uh, you make it real every day. So thank you so much. Um, um, for also helping make the president, vice president's commitment to equity uh, uh, real for folks. Um, I hope you, that, that it's tough following that powerhouse panel. We have work to do, y'all. Well, I think we can do it, all right? We can do it. Um, uh, the, um, but I hope you can tell that um, we're very serious about leveraging the, the, the full power and resources of the federal government 
uh, to make sure that we make real and lasting positive change in communities all across uh, this country. Uh, the only way we can do that is, is indeed if we're doing it together. So again, thank you for your uh, leadership. I will tell you just from my, my former work as a, as a mayor, um, uh, being proximate uh, to the issues um, and having a real partner in the federal government makes a lot of a of, of difference. Um, and you can actually be very precise in directing uh, resources to where they matter um, uh, most. Uh, the president, when the president told me I was taking this job, he didn't offer me a job. That's a whole other story. Uh, well, he, was, he was very clear that, um, that we were to make sure we built strong partnerships with the community that were, that were focused really on, on the fact that, that, you, that you're not just going out selling uh, the successes of the administration, but we're doing a, 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 a more work listening and trying to figure out how we can do things so much better. So this, this advice and counsel you're providing us today makes a difference. So we're going to next, uh, for the next 45 minutes, we're going to spend some time hearing directly from our leaders on the front line who are doing great work, um, hear uh, from folks who are inspired to action in their respective uh, communities and from um, some of our wonderful partners at federal agencies who are helping make a difference for the American um, uh, people. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with our, our, um, our first discussion. Um, Deputy Administrator McCabe, I'm going to give you the first question, okay? Um, so tell us why advancing um, equity remains a priority across the work of the agency. Well, um, Mayor Brendan, thank you so much for including us and my friend and colleague Vernice here with me to speak on behalf of, of the communities that we serve. Um, uh, and I share your just sort of honor and awe in following the previous panel when, when I hear our cabinet speak. I just feel so lucky to be part of this administration. Um, and I'm glad that you're starting with the environment because the environment and public health is at the basis of everything that makes life okay for people in this country. Um, and uh, from the very first minute, President Biden and Administrator Regan has made clear that equity is what we are all about every single day. Study after study shows that if you are black or brown or poor, you are very likely exposed to unfair pollution in your community. Your water's not as clean, your air is not as clean, your land is not as clean, and you do not have the kinds of opportunities that others have because of there's more likely to be more lead in the blood of your children, there's likely to be more asthma keeping you out of school or out of work, um, and you're more exposed to chemicals that can um, cause or contribute to cancer and other very, very serious illnesses. This is not fair, it's not right, it's been going on for decades, and this administration is gonna make sure that we're doing everything we can to turn that around. EPA has been around since 1970, and it was established to provide a clean environment for everybody. But we know that we haven't gotten there yet. And fortunately, so many of the programs that we work on naturally focuses on, focuses on areas where the burdens are not fair. And um, we can talk today some more. Um, so and, and we'll- Why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about, about that, some of the things that you've been doing. Okay, uh, great, yeah. so great, great, great. Well, the, la the last superstar panel cut into my time a little bit, so oh, I'm, so, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm right. move. I hear ya. <laughs> I hear ya, okay. <laughs> And I want to make sure that we'll just throw the agenda uh, sort of got, to the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> so, um, and I want to make sure that Vernice has oh, a. Oh, no, has, no. Has, and then her question is a response. But, to your yeah, questions. gotcha. All right. So people think, uh, well, I don't know how people think about EPA, except I kind of do, but um, EPA. <laughs> e EPA is one of the smaller agencies in the federal government, and people think of us often as a regulatory agency, they don't want to see us come in, we're bringing an enforcement order, we're taking people to court or whatever, and we do that um, where we need to, right? But through the President's bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, we have now become a major player in funding and funding that's going into these communities that need it the most, as I've just been describing. Um, and I'll mention a couple, Mayor, if, if I could, some of the real game changers billions and billions of dollars going into communities to replace water infrastructure. That means lead service lines. Every community across the country is the president's goal, that there will not be a lead service line left in this country. That's a huge thing. And along the way, fixing all kinds of other things that, that mean that people have less than appropriate 
drinking water and wastewater systems because they're poor or black or brown. And I think Renice is going to talk about that. Um, another massive thing that EPA is now able to do, thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, $27 billion to go into the country to finance clean energy and environmental improvement projects that in communities where financing is not accessible to them. You're a renter in a poor community in my hometown of Indianapolis. Good luck getting a loan to put solar panels on your house, right? Just won't happen. This money is going directly to that, and it will build up a system across the country, build capacity that will be self-sustaining to provide these kinds of loans in these communities. We're so excited about that. And of course, um, uh, Justice 40, the President's Justice 40 initiative, tells us all, you better be investing or at least 40% of these benefits in the communities that deserve it the most. I'll mention one other program and then, and then we can uh, move, move on. Um, our cleanup, our land cleanup programs, Brownfields and Superfund, so many of those sites are located in the kinds of communities that we're talking about. And what the Inflation Act and, and the bipartisan infrastructure allowed us to do was we've got, we've got a list of sites that are ready to go and ready to be cleaned up. They just need the cash to do it. And with these billions of dollars, the people in our land office could say, okay, this one, this one, this one, go. And those are in the communities that we, that we are focused on. The administrator tells us every day, EJ in the DNA at the EPA. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. I got a little bit of the Bronx, the birth of hip hop over here. <laughs> Uh, along with the Debbie and Ms. <laughs> I know you'd appreciate that, Siobhan. Yeah. The, um, Ms. Miller Travis, uh, tell us how the, um, an example maybe how federal funding is making a difference in the communities that, that you serve, addressing the needs there. Well, um, Janet mentioned, uh, uh, she mentioned the um, water infrastructure issues that are happening. Uh, I think it's, it's unbeknownst to many how many communities do not have access to safe drinking water and sanitary sewage systems in 2024, right? Not just native reservations, though there are many, and native nations, but urban communities, rural communities, all kinds of communities, suburban communities that have been bypassed by um, water infrastructure. And communities right next to them, to the left and to the right, have access to those systems, but they do not. And they've been asking for decades to have their wastewater and drinking water systems upgraded. And now that's going to happen, right? Um, and the lead service line replacement issue is huge. Everybody knows about Flint, Michigan, but do you know that there are seven cities in Michigan that had higher levels of lead in their drinking water than Flint, including the state capital of Michigan, Lansing, Michigan? That work has to happen. And by it not happening, it gives us decades of inequities, right? Developmental disabilities from drinking and being exposed to elevated levels of lead um, in your drinking water. Developmental dif disabilities that cannot be undone, right? So these are legacy issues that we're asking EPA to respond to, and EPA is in fact responding to, and the administration is in fact responding to. There are the energy issues are, are another one. The green school bus issues, the EV school bus issues are another one. Um, there are so many issues that EPA is addressing that it, it is literally hard to categorize them or to catalog them because there are hundreds of them. I'll, I'll just give it to you this way, Mayor. Um, in 2000, I went to work at the Ford Foundation as the first ever program officer for environmental justice. And I was giving out, and I was giving out $4 million a year in grants nationwide. And you could not tell me that I was not going to change the world with that $4 million, right? <laughs> It took me about six months to realize, oh my God, um, this is so not adequate, right? But EPA was giving out $5 million nationwide in, in environmental justice grants. Today, right here, right now, at least in the one office of environmental justice and external civil rights, they're giving out $2.6 billion in grant making to go to to disadvantaged communities, to tribal communities, to rural communities, to 
um, black and brown communities to communities on the border that have no infrastructure whatsoever, $2.6 billion, as EPA Administrator Michael Regan likes to say, um, billion with a B, right? Don't get it confused. That's billion with a B. Orders of magnitude, more money than we ever could have imagined. Um, and why are we doing that? Because the president sees us. He sees us. He sees our communities. He sees the inequities. He sees the wrongs that have to be written. And we're at the table through the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, through the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, in conversation with other federal agencies. We are at the table helping to advise and shape what those programs look like and identifying where they need to go. It is a, it's a game-changing moment. It's a hi history-making moment in terms of the amount of resources that EPA is rolling out to go into and address environmental justice and environmental inequities. Oh, I love it. I tell you what. <laughs> we have three more panels. Everybody else, uh, step up your game, okay? Uh, <laughs> following these two, <laughs> there's some work to do. This is, uh, this is excellent. Um, Madam Deputy Administrator, uh, what new strategies from your agency's um, updated equity action plan um, do you think will have the most impact on, on communities in this year? Yeah, I, um, first of all, so awesome. Um, I wanted to pick up on something you said, Vernice, that goes exactly to your question, Mayor. So one of the challenging things that I imagine you've all experienced this too is, you know, once you kind of get in the door and know how to apply for a federal grant, you kind of, it's kind of easier, but it's very hard to get in that first time. Um, and the USA grant system, not the most easy thing to use, um, which is an understatement. So one of the things that we're doing and one of our strategies in our equity action plan is to uh, bring groups into the system, give them access to resources that wouldn't have ever had them before. And we're doing two incredible things. Uh, one is that we have created through some of this $3 billion that, that um, the Inflation Reduction Act provided, we're creating something called the Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. There's 16 of them across the country. There's one in every EPA region. There's one that, one that focused on supporting tribes and, and several others as well. And they are in the community for, to be an intermediary, to be a technical assistance center for local groups to help figure out how to get in the door. And then next to them, we've created the Thriving Communities Grant Makers, where we will pass money down to 11 organizations, and they will actually work with the groups to get them the grants and do away with, while making sure that we're accountable and that we can, we can show Congress that this money is going where they intended to go, but it will just make it so much easier. And this will, this is an investment not just in that very grant or that very loan, but in the future because it will build capacity. And as proof that this works, one of our recent grant applications, we three quarters of the applicants were groups we had never heard from before. So, so that's just really that's fantastic. Real, that's real, out, real outreach. And I'm gonna um, muscle through before I get, start getting the signs that I'm running out of time. Uh, you wanna, want the last word? Uh, so those grants that, that Janet just mentioned, the last group she mentioned, of which there are, did you say 10? The change, the 11? At $50 million a pop. $50 million a pop. The technical assistance, um, the Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers are 10 to $13 million a pop. I wanna lift up um, West Harlem Environmental Action in New York City that's driving the region um, to um, Tic Tac Center. I want to lift up the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice in New Orleans that's driving the EPA Region 4 and Region 6 Tic Tac Center. I want to lift up and shout out um, Blacks and Green um, in Chicago that's driving the Region 5, um, tic, EPA Region 5 Tic Tac Community Center. These are people on the front lines who've been doing the work in the, in the case of the Deep South Center for 30 years, in the case of We Act for Environmental Justice, 35 years of trying to make these communities seen help them be heard 
address the, the health inadequacies, address the, the, um, the disparities in mortality, um, the short, shortening life expectancy from people who are beset by environmental threats. Again, the president has seen us and has heard us, and I want to end with this. Um, I'm from New York also, from Harlem. Um, when I grew up, Adam Clayton Powell was our congressman, but in central Brooklyn, there was this congresswoman, the first black woman elected to Congress named Shirley Chisholm, and she represented central Brooklyn. And you know this is really generous of me because I'm from Harlem and I'm giving Brooklyn a shout out, I just want to say. Um, but she used to say this, promises made and promises kept. And that's what I feel the Biden-Harris administration has done in this instance in terms of the equity grant making and the equity program, programming and policy making. I'm not sure if y'all realize. That gave her the microphone, didn't even ask her a question, okay? I just, I just know. <laughs> I can read a room. I can read a room and being married to a smart, uh, strong black woman, I knew she had some closing statements. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And keep, let's keep it going. All right. God bless you. All right. At this time, it's my great honor to welcome to the stage the Veterans Affairs Deputy Secretary Bradshaw who will discuss VA's, excuse me, discuss VA's efforts to tackle inequality and strengthen support to women's veterans. Deputy Secretary Bradshaw is a fourth generation veteran, an Iraq comic veteran, who is now the first woman deputy secretary of VA, the highest ranking woman in VA history, and the first woman of color to serve in this position. I don't think I want to go back to my office today. I want to stay here all day and uh, <laughs> near, keep curating this room like this. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, Deputy Secretary, thank you so much uh, for joining us on the stage. Um, why don't you tell us, how, why has advancing equity uh, remained a priority across the work of the agency? Absolutely. So first and foremost, we know that African Americans serve at a higher percentage in the United States military than their percentage inside the United States, and the same for Hispanic and Latino. So when you look at taking care of our nation's veterans, we are actually able to take care of a higher percentage of our African American and our Hispanic veterans because that's, they're representing us inside the United States military. For myself, my father didn't go to college. However, he was able to send me to college because as an NCO in the United States Army, he could afford tuition. That was the blessing that received in my family. And so many of our families serve so that we can have the education. What people don't always realize is VA, not the military, this is a secret, are the ones that give out the GI Bill. Everyone thinks that it actually comes from the Department of Defense. It's actually a VA benefit. So every time you hear the GI Bill, it's the VA. So think of how many Americans in rural America, African Americans, Latin Americans, are able to continue their education because of the GI Bill. For me, my dad paid for my undergrad, but the United States VA, Department of Veterans Affairs, paid for my master's. And those are the opportunities that we have. We were charged by President Biden to take care of all veterans, not some veterans, all veterans. So the way we're able to do that is to make sure that we do outreach to all communities. We want to make sure that they know about the phenomenal benefits that they have earned through their service. And so making sure that we tap into um, uh, untethered communities, urban communities, suburban communities, everyone, we want to make sure that all veterans are able to have the resources that they so tr truly deserve. Well, fantastic. And it's a uh I'm sure the perspective, your perspective as a trailblazer as well is affecting um, the work you do at the agency. Can you give us some examples of, of the barriers to equity that the agency has, has been trying to address and how federal funding um, has helped um, help you get the work done, maybe better meeting the needs of the communities you serve? So the biggest change that we have under the Biden-Harris administration is the PACT Act. The PACT Act is giving another million veterans access to benefits that they didn't have access to before. And what that is, is that's toxic exposure. So think about your 9-11 generation. Those, you know, I deployed to Iraq 
And when I would go for a run, I would pass by the burn pit. And I was kind of a silly runner because I realized if I did a figure eight, I could actually extend my run, but I was running by the burn pit twice, which is kind of dumb. And what would happen is I'd take a shower and then I would start coughing. All the gunk from the burn pit, my eyes would water. Those us that were exposed to all these toxic exposures for the last 20 plus years now have presumptives. So it's gonna be so much quicker. So i.e., let's say for me, I have sinusitis. Sinusitis is now a presumptive under PACT Act. I was in Iraq, I have sinusitis, boom, that is a presumptive. It is now claimed. So we have that so many. We have 276 conditions now that the PACT Act covers. And because we know that the 9-11 generation was such a diverse generation, and we also know that Vietnam was another diverse generation. Hypertension is now automatically covered under the PACT Act. So if you have any friends or family who served in Vietnam and they haven't filed for the BA benefits, please encourage them. If you have any friends and family, if you have any friends and family that served in the military, please encourage them to file for the VA benefits. I'm just gonna say that up front. Because so many times people will listen to someone in charge and think that, oh, I don't qualify. I have literally talked to Vietnam veterans who have said, Viet, sorry, Vietnam era veterans who said, because I didn't go to Vietnam, the VA is not for me. That is simply not the case. Everyone who has served qualifies for VA. Fantastic. And the same question I asked the uh, Deputy Administrator, what, um, what new strategies from your agency's updated equity action plan uh, do you think will have the most impact on communities this year? So what we're able to do is really look at data, data in a way we haven't before. And so we're finding some commonalities with that data that's going to be really important. We know that veterans that now file within their first year of getting out of the service, they have less disparities. We know veterans that use a VSO in order to file they claim, they have less disparities. So the other piece too is having checks and balances within our service to make sure, within our, our VBA, to make sure that as claims are being processed, that that is also one of the areas we're taking a look at to make sure we're equitable across the board. And we're super fortunate for our VA employees. Well, thank you for your service to our country in so many different respects in your family service. And let's keep thank pushing, you. making sure these uh, wonderful um, heroes are taken care of. Absolutely. All Thank right. you, and have God a wonderful you. day. I'm very pleased to welcome our third panel uh, for a discussion. So the per folks that we're going to be bringing up are, uh, excuse me, Department of Transportation Undersecretary Carlos Monge, if you could join us. <laughs> Undersecretary Monge has spent his career promoting equity and economic development. He'll discuss DOT's recent investments in Philadelphia under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. He'll be joined by Dr. Sachin Paprathan, who is seated next to Mayor Benjamin. He is the Executive Director of the U.S. Access Board and National Disability Justice Policy Leader. And lastly, we will bring LaTanya Bird. She is a national safety advocate and founder of Families for Safe Streets, Greater Philadelphia. Under Secretary Monhe, uh, tell us um, why advancing equity remains a priority across the work of the agency, and give us an example of maybe how federal funding has uh, enabled the agency to address the needs of the communities you serve. Well, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> she, oh, sorry. Oh, she's ready. She's ready. She's ready. She's uh, ready. No, the uh, why we do it is because transportation matters to equity. Yeah. You know, it's the second largest uh, expense for families, and at its best. Our transportation network connects people to jobs, to opportunity, to services, to education. And at its worst, it does the opposite. You know, and uh, over decades of, dis of uh, disinvestment, the costs uh, and the benefits of, of our transportation network have been unevenly addressed. We know that black and brown communities faced triple uh, the increase in traffic deaths during the pandemic, that native tribes today have double the fatal fatality rate uh, than the rest of the nation. 
um, our airlines uh, mishandled 11,000 11, wheelchairs uh, and scooters last year. And that, you know, it's a, that's a human right, uh, the ability to travel. Uh, and a quarter of our transit stations are not accessible. That's more than 30 years after the ADA. Um, the good news is uh, that we've got a lot of money to fix it. You know, uh, $650 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law, and we are doing everything we can at the department to put equity at the center of what we're doing. Um, and that's making sure that, um, that, uh, that we can get more workers into the system. That, you know, these are jobs uh, to operate, maintain, and build our system that don't require college degrees. Uh, we are increasing our DBE goals and reaching them. Uh, we are uh, investing for the first time money to reconnect communities that have been divided by highways. You know, S Secretary Fox is here. Um, I worked with him. He was my boss in the last administration as well. And I, I think of him as um, Moses, you know, because it was him, uh, you know. Uh, who, you see, when you get older, yeah, man, yeah. you see how they treat you? With, with yeah. young, this, this young, this baby Moses or old Moses? Which old Moses? <laughs> Uh, I've never seen him in a, in a, in a basket, but um, <laughs> but uh, but you know it was it was him telling the story of of his uh, of his hometown in Charlotte and how the highway divided his neighborhood and and just like Moses uh, didn't make it to the promised land, I feel like this administration, the Joshua generation, you know, is 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 bringing it home, and uh, only that he is also chairing our advisory committee on on transportation equity, which means Joshua now has Moses on speed dial. Uh, and he's meeting with the secretary today. So we are doing everything we can and, and really, really, um, uh, I think going to have a huge impact in, our, on, in this country. That's, that's fantastic. And I know this room is full of people uh, spurred into action and leadership uh, based on life experiences. And Ms. Bird, uh, Latanya, um, can you speak to what federal funds and actions have meant for safety in your community? And we got you involved, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Um, the federal funds, um, you know, I'm from Philadelphia, and um, this is like amazing, okay, because that um, infrastructure bill here with the president actually touched down in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, okay. Um, I don't know if most of you, you, you hear about Philly all the time, but basically, um, the Family for Safe Streets, um, I became a co-founder because I had lost my family members along the Roosevelt Boulevard, um, which is a 12-lane highway. Um, and I guess I could tell the story now. I'm not sure if that's a good time. Um, I would like to my, have a picture of my family that was lost on the Roosevelt Boulevard. Um, there are many... Uh, let's say crashes in a city, most people call them accidents. Um, some crashes are not accidents. So for Family for Safe Streets, we wanna call them crashes, a crash, okay? So living in a city, I grew up in, in, in North Philadelphia, I lived in different various areas in, in the city, and um, we walk, okay? We ride our bikes. Um, you know, most of you when you're children, that's what you do. Um, and you know, my niece, uh, Samara, um, the reason I am here and not her mother is because my sister had passed maybe like seven years before Samara had lost her life. So Samara became a second mother to her siblings. And she started to have her own family. But what happened was Samara, she received Section 8. And she had a house. And, and the whole thing was, okay, she has to get a big house enough to have her brothers and sisters and her children. So she decided to move right across from Roosevelt Boulevard. And the family is like, okay, you're across the boulevard, okay? But people cross the boulevard. When you're walking and you're living in your city, you walk, you don't think about, I never thought about the Roosevelt Boulevard, I never thought about 12 lanes. I didn't. And um, so our communities have been, you know, divided um, because of, you know, she's in the north part of the Roosevelt Boulevard, and then you have the northeast part of the Roosevelt Boulevard. Um, however, as our city started to grow, and you start building strip malls, and you start bringing more business into the area, you bring more traffic into the area. So as you're growing, and you know, the, the, the area is growing, no one's changing the road design, the design, the safety part of it is left out. So, the people, the normal people who cross the street are like the cars are taking over, you know. Um, but it was a hot summer day and she, you know, the kids played in the, 
you know, they played in the pool and all of that, and they decided to walk home one night um, and, and cross. And, um, you know, a couple of guys, you know, were drag racing along the Roosevelt Boulevard, and they didn't see them, and they hit them. Now, um, it was devastating. Samira's oldest son was the only survivor. Um, Samira's um, half-sister was another one. She was a survivor, you know. Um, but four lives were lost. Now, many lives were lost on that Roosevelt Boulevard. There are many Roosevelt Boulevards in this country, okay? So everything is being designed for speed, right? And for you to get from point A to point B. But when you live in, let's say, North Philadelphia in certain areas, in our city, which I don't know some of you, well, people who know Philly, the Northeast section at one point wanted to be their own city. Now, the subway doesn't connect. It, 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 it stops because people don't want the people from the North Philly in certain areas going into those areas, right? So what, we're, what we have done is um, basically me, once we lost my family members, um, the Bicycle Coalition of Greater Philadelphia reached out to me, you know, and I was like, the Bicycle Coalition, like, who are they? Like, but not knowing that they were advocates for change, safety, transportation, people who ride their bikes, people who walk, you know, just fighting for their rights. And when they reached out to me and our mayor at the time, uh, Mayor Kenny, he decided to adopt the Vision Zero um, initiative um, in which, believe, believe it or not, he, he let me talk to anybody in his, in his uh, cabinet or his, his uh, team anytime I wanted to talk to them. Uh, we talked about just what needed to be done and they started um, something called the Route for Change, which is, um, I'm, I was so excited to see it was a route for change for the city, but guess what? Pictures of neighborhoods that I know, pictures of how they are now and what they can be in the future. I was over the top. I'm like, okay, you're looking at us. You're, you're not gonna keep repaving those streets in the Northeast, okay? Because that's what happened with Samira, okay? So a billion dollar company got a contract to fix the area, certain parts in the streets that need repairs. They subcontracted that out. Those subcontractors said, we're not going to those neighborhoods. But guess what? They signed off that that work was done. All right? That's not fair. Right? So this change um, that came about and uh, actually was our years of advocating and putting this data together helped us get the $70 million from this infrastructure uh, bill that the president had, has passed. If I could jump, jump in here, Thank which you. is oh, that uh, because of the funding that President Biden got through Congress, we were able to give Philadelphia $78 million to fix Roosevelt Boulevard. That is uh, 12 miles of, of changes they're going to make sure that nobody has to go through uh, what uh, Latanya's family had to go through. Thank you uh, so much for sharing and being spurred into action and uh, taking, I often I would tell people, I told a group before I came here, I came here years and years for infrastructure week every uh, um, God knows how long, and now having the real resources to, in a, in a very real way, um, to address these um, uh, these critical needs. It's thank you for sharing, and thank, thank you, you for leading. Thank, thank you for leading. Um, Sachin, speak to if you can how these federal funds are, uh, and, I, and I call them Sachin because I can't pronounce his last name, and, and, uh, and actually uh, do it effectively. I need some practice on that one. Um, on um, what they've meant for people with disabilities and, and the greater uh, community uh, connectivity. Uh, would, would you speak to that, please? Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having the U.S. Access Board join here uh, today. You know, the conversation about equity also, you know, for people with disabilities an important conversation and it's uh, this administration, the work this administration has done so far and continues to do to lift the people with disabilities to have equal access is, is quite remarkable. It has never been done before and it's amazing what is happening. And the Access Board has a long-standing relationship with uh, the Department of Transportation. We work hand in hand with the different standards that we work on. 
Um, over the last year, last summer, the Access Board uh, finalized a piece of regulation called the P Public Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines, which ensures accessibility for all people with disabilities to have access to your basic access around your environments, like sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, pedestrian signals, transit stops, things you would think should be accessible for everyone living within the community. So those standards were finalized. It will be enforceable when the Department of Transportation and the Department of Justice um, adopts it. DOT worked very closely with us to make sure that is done and that is, you know, that is, works well with the enforceable standards. It's for someone like me who is blind, you know, we all know when we walk around in a busy city like in the DC, it is noisy, and someone like me who is trying to cross the street, I don't want to just follow someone because he or she is walking down the street, and sometimes it's a surprise because they might be jaywalking, and I don't want to be jaywalking. But, you know, auditory pedestrian signals, something that, that helps me as a blind person, gives me an indicator it's time for me to cross. Those are just the bare minimum standards that we all need to have access to just for being safe when we get around. Uh, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, there's a big emphasis on EV charging and inf infrastructure bill. We worked very closely with DOT again to make sure technical standards for that is available as well. We had a technical document that we released closely working with DOT uh, in 2022, and now we are working on the regulation to make it enforceable standards so that people with disabilities who have electric vehicle charging, uh, EV cars, can also have access to accessible EV charging stations. You know, hopefully someday I can pull up with my own. <laughs> EV car and be able to charge, but you know it's it's the work to make sure that all people with disabilities have equal access, and this the work that this administration is doing to ensure that happens is remarkable. Sure, thank thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Mr. Undersecretary, uh, maybe the, the the last question, uh, just as I asked your predecessors. So what new strategies from your agency's updated equity action plan um, do you think will have the most impact on communities in 2024? Well, um, just building on uh, what you heard just here is that we are uh, institutionalizing equity in the department is the big change for us. Uh, but uh, we are taking the baton that the Access Board gave us to make sure that our, our streets, our sidewalks are accessible to people. You shouldn't be, uh, just one example, an Olympic athlete to be able to go up the, the grade of these ramps uh, with a manual wheelchair. Uh, we've got a three-year strategy uh, to make sure that, um, uh, to do research so that you can bring your own wheelchair on in an airplane. Uh, you know, uh, on, on safety, uh, one of the best programs we have now, uh, new because of the bipartisan infrastructure law, is the Safe Streets and Roads for All program. Two good things about it is it's going directly to communities that need it, who understand their Roosevelt Boulevards, who understand their challenges. Uh, we uh, have reached 800 communities, half the population. The second great thing about it is that it's data-driven. We are giving people a map of where the crashes are happening and overlaying where those disadvantaged communities are so they can make, they can hold themselves accountable about how they're spending that money. Uh, so uh, again, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the superlatives are over the, the most money for transit in history, the most money for rail since Amtrak, uh, but we gotta make sure that every American uh, can benefit from that, from that, from those resources. No, thank you. This amazing investment in equity um, is so in, so important, and I I, uh, I want to call you Secretary Moses now. Uh, but <laughs> but having tablets. but having served as a are you are you going to hear about that one? Uh, uh, but you know with these uh, the, these amazing investments uh, in, in, in equity and how we move not only products but people in in a safe way, and I think just the general investments in the public square. In a, in a world in which um, it seems like our relationships fray, making those investments in the public square that bring people together and how we convene, it's so important. I just want to thank each of you for your collective leadership. God bless you. All right. All right.
All right. We are joining um, our last panel now, and thank you so much for the last panel for sharing uh, such heartfelt remarks and really, really positive work. Very pleased to join to the stage. Please welcome Department of Commerce Deputy Secretary Don Graves to discuss driving U.S. innovation and global competitiveness through local chips, hubs, under chips, and the American Rescue Plan. He will be joined by Ms. Donna Ennis, who is the co-leader of the Georgia AI Manufacturing Technology Corridor and former leader of the Georgia Minority Business Development Agency. No, um, Deputy Secretary and I, we, we try to have at least a weekly meeting in this building on one topic or another, so this counts as our weekly meeting. Okay. Wait, uh, you mean you're not, you're going to cut out a meeting that I could get uh, to raise a bunch of issues with you? <laughs> no, but, so tell us, um, why is advancing equity remain a priority across the, the work of the agency? I think the most important thing to take away to begin with is that the Department of Commerce is probably the most misunderstood department in the federal government. <laughs> and I say that because everyone thinks, oh, the Department of Business. Yeah, you all work with the CEOs, you know, it, it, as you said, money, money, the money folks. Well, we are a department that focuses on business and commerce, but we're also the department of data and science and information. We're the census, we're the Bureau of Economic Analysis, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which includes the National Weather Service. We're also the department of people and communities. We're the department that focuses on every single community in the country, the Economic Development Administration, the health and success of our communities, the Minority Business Development Agency, the single agency in the federal government that focuses on the uplift, the long-term success of socially and economically disadvantaged businesses. I could go on. There are 13 different bureaus. I'm not going to go through every one of them. But we are a department that is focused on the lived experiences of Americans. And so equity is important because if you don't represent all Americans, if you don't understand every community, if you don't have folks who look like, live in, understand these communities, then how can you represent these communities and ensure that we have success? So we're very focused on making sure that our economy can succeed, that we can make sure that our science is delivering uh, that we understand the impacts in our communities, not just some, not just those that are the haves, but every single community, whether you're urban, rural, suburban, doesn't matter. That's why it's important for us because we can only succeed if we represent all of our communities and all of our people. No, thank you, and, um, and including your great work you're all doing on broadband uh, as well. Uh, give us an example of how federal funding has maybe enabled you to address um, some of the communities you serve. Well, I, I love this question because what, part of what we think about every day is innovation. How can we drive innovation in, uh, uh, in every community across the country? And why is that important? Um, I think about uh, the folks who have been great innovators in the past. Part of the reason that they're such good innovators is because of their lived experiences. And in honor of Black History Month, I think about uh, folks, uh, some of the, the, the famous black innovators that uh, we've seen over the course of history. Uh, uh, Patricia Bath, Dr. Uh, Patricia Bath, who was the, uh, an ophthalmologist, famous pioneering ophthalmologist, who came up with surgery for cataracts. Well, why did she think about focusing on cataracts? Well, cataracts affect the African American community at four times the rate that does other communities. So that lived experience led to a focus and innovations in ways that uh, we hadn't seen before. Same thing with uh, Shirley Jackson. Uh, I know some of you uh, know she was the first uh, African-American woman uh, a, a graduate with a doctorate from MIT. She also, so it gets back to what you raised, she was also the person whose pioneering research led to the development of fiber optic cables. So, we wouldn't be talking today about laying fiber optic cables, connecting every single community, which is what we're doing at Commerce with high-speed internet, were it not for the pioneering work of an innovator 
like, uh, Shirley, uh, like Shirley Jackson. So part of what we're focused on is making sure that we can drive innovation using the lived experiences of so many Americans. We have these wonderful, thanks to the president and the vice president, getting uh, major legislation passed. We have resources, the likes of which we've never seen before, which is enabling us to create tech hubs. It's enabling us to, uh, to support reclaiming the chips industry back in the United States. It uh, includes things uh, like the Build Back Better Regional Challenge Program, a uh, billion dollars that our Economic Development Administration has, uh, has invested in communities across the country. What that's doing is investing in a place-based way. And we've been very intentional about thinking about place as the key ingredient here, because not every place is built the same or gets the same attention. We're very focused on making sure that not just a few of the places in our country, the cities that have succeeded over many years are getting funding, but that we're thinking about investing in communities in an intentional way because young men and women, boys and girls, they have hopes and dreams and they have ideas that are, could be earth shattering, but the problem is that the resources don't flow to them. So if you have hopes and dreams, it's our job to provide the opportunity so that they can live lives of dignity. And so that's what we're doing at Commerce. We're focusing very much on tech hubs. We're very focusing very much on innovation. That's why I'm so glad that, uh, that uh, my uh, friend and, and former colleague, uh, Donna Ennis, is here today. Uh, can I brag on her a little bit before? She, um, so so this, this young lady, uh, is uh, the uh, co-director of something called the Georgia AI Manufacturing Coalition. Uh, it's, it's a coalition that's focused on AI. We all know, we've heard the stories about how, how AI is changing the world. There's a lot of reasons to be nervous about it, but there's also good reason to think that it's going to change the world in a positive way, and that's what she's focused on. How can we drive manufacturing innovation using AI, and her point in all of this, and why they, part of the reason they won the, the grant that they did, $65 billion, million dollars, um, is because equity is at the core of everything that they do. Now, Donna has a, an, another great history. She was also the director of the Georgia Minority Business Development uh, Business Center, uh, which what was it, $6.4 billion in, in fund contracts and opportunities. 7,000 jobs created. So we're very pleased that, that Donna was, is leading this, uh, this coalition in Georgia. Thank now, you. Now, Donna, I have one job here, okay? One job. Don't take my job, man. I know, right? <laughs> he spoke with what you. He took, said. You took my, my meeting away so I can take your job. I want to say what he said. <laughs> Oh, no, absolutely. T tell us how these resources well, are, are making a difference. Well, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for being here. I am just so excited about everything that I heard today. Um, and the fact that we're ending on innovation, I think, is really appropriate because everything you heard today, all of the panels wrapped around everything you heard today is technology and innovation. From the beginning when the congressman talked about the solar panels to today, we're talking about innovation. Georgia AIM, the Artificial Intelligence and Manufacturing, is the result of the Build Back Better funding. The funding itself was innovative. It's the first time that EDA has um, chosen to utilize a coalition funding model. What does that mean for us? It means that I work with partners throughout the states who are individually funded to work in their communities on AI and manufacturing. So we have everybody from the technical college system of Georgia to Georgia Tech, uh, which was where I am, to HBCUs, the Russell Innovation Center for Entrepreneurship, which focuses on black, um, black uh, and brown entrepreneurs, Spelman College, Fort Valley State, um, the Te Technology Association of Georgia. We just have over 40 partners on the ground working to customize solutions in AI and manufacturing um, for, for our communities. So we're really excited that we were able to implement this model. Um, 
we, uh, we recently hosted an innovation conference with the Georgia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And a Georgia Tech professor um, did a great evolution, Dr. Um, Irfan Issa, did a great evolution of AI. But at the end, he said, you know, people think that AI is going to replace your jobs. No, people using AI are going to replace people who don't use AI. And I will say to you the same thing for our businesses. Businesses using AI will replace those businesses that are not using AI. And I also say that technology enable, technology own. We have got to get our black and brown and rural communities up to speed in technology. And I don't mean just using a phone or Office 365 or whatever version they're using today. There is a paradigm shift going on right now. And I know all of the agencies are experiencing that through the equity, the lens of equity, through the lens of technology, through the, the billions and billions of dollars that are not only flowing in the federal space, but they're flowing in the private sector as well. There's, they say there's a change coming, the change is here. And so I'm here to say my mantra is technology enabled, technology owned. And so through our Georgia AIM program, we have been able to work together as a coalition. The African proverb that says, if you wanna go alone, I mean, if you wanna go fast, you go what? Alone. If you wanna go far, you go together. And that's what we're doing in Georgia with our Georgia AIM program. Um, just really quickly, a couple of really good, great successes. We just recently graduated veterans from our, there's a veteran uh, retraining center in middle Georgia. And those veterans will go on to, um, 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 work at maybe be transitioned into Warner's uh, Robin Air Force, uh, Air Force Base, into our Advanced Technology, um, um, Advanced Manufacturing Center, as well as into private sector. Um, we, we have, uh, let me just refer to my notes because that's what they made them for. Um, one of the things that's really exciting are the mobile labs. So through the Russell Center, UGA, University of Georgia, Fort Valley, we've developed, um, we're developing mobile labs that will take the technology into our rural communities, into our black and brown communities, to show them what does VR look like? What does um, augmented reality look like? What are sensors doing for now, right? We also want to demystify AI. We want to demystify and make manufacturing cool again. You know, manufacturing is not the dark, dirty, dangerous, dull places that it used to be. It is a place where if, you know, students could just work or have internships, they could see. So we have competitions across the state in STEM. We have our inventor prizes coming up with over 4,000 kids that compete with each other. In, in a, we have a Lego competition. So we're doing things within the community to help bring um, AI, to help introduce smart technologies um, to our communities, to our companies, um, and to rural areas as well. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. We have this really good looking man on the back row who has to hold up time signs. <laughs> he hadn't lifted that sign one time. The whole, I'm like, there's no way in the world I'm not over time right now. He puts a one minute. Okay, one minute. Uh, maybe final word, uh, Mr. Depsack. Um, any new strategies from your updated equity plan uh, that you think might have the most impact on communities in 2024? I'll be brief. Uh, Sector Cardona talked about it earlier. Intentionality underpins everything that we've done in this administration. It's why the president and vice president have been, I think, the most successful at uh, accomplishing all that they have. Uh, uh, part of what we're doing is building off of the series of uh, programs that we put in place. So we started with the Build Back Better regional challenge coming out of the um, American Rescue Plan which is investing in place-based regional economic development that is focused on innovation. Then you match that with our investments through our Tech Hubs program, our CHIPS program, uh, the Recompete program dollars. These are all built to, build, to uh, uh, build off of the work that we did with the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. It's place-based focus, an intentional effort at uh, reclaiming U.S. leadership in a whole range of areas of innovation, critical and emerging technologies like uh, biohealth, uh, biotech, uh, quantum computing, AI, 
uh, supercomputing and the like, we can only be successful if we also make sure that every community in this country has the opportunity to participate. That's why there's this big focus at Commerce on place-based uh, economic development that is focused on innovation because innovation, great ideas, and brain power, the talent doesn't just reside in uh, New York and Silicon Valley and Austin. It, res it resides in East Cleveland and Oakland and Pine Ridge and every other community across this country. So we have to find ways that we can amplify, lift up that innovation. That's what we're doing uh, with the new programs that we're implementing this, uh, the next year and then four more after that. This has been so exciting and inspiring. Uh, thank you, uh, Nira and the team, for uh, including us uh, uh, in this. She asked me for more Oprah and less Springer. I think we got there. We, we kept it straight. <laughs> Uh, but, the, but the reality, and I think the, the, the central theme here, obviously historic investments in clean energy and manufacturing and infrastructure, but that, that connective tissue, that real commitment to equity only happens with real partnership. So uh, incredible policy leadership, but real partnership. You all are doing the work every single day and just want to encourage you to keep pushing, keep pushing. People are counting on you. God bless you. Thank you. All right, everybody. I want, to, I want to thank Mayor Benjamin and his team, uh, the OMB folks and their team, GPC, White House Council, CEQ. I want to do a special shout out for the DPC team, uh, Amber Green, Andrea O'Neill, Robbie Ha, Jenny Yang. Uh, they're phenomenal leaders who've been driving this work. Uh, this is a great and important day but it has taken uh, days, weeks, months, feels like years to get here. Uh, and so I really wanna express my gratitude to them. Just, I'll just close with this. This has been a phenomenal conversation and really grateful for the leadership also at our agencies who are driving phenomenal work where you are. Yes, let's give them a hand. And, of course, all of this is work is possible because we have leaders who are intentionally driving equity in order to ensure that every single person has a fair chance. That's what this work is about. Uh, I will say we are, we're not done yet. We're driving more action this year. We'll be back in touch soon, but really just want to express just the inspiration all of you are, the stories here today are about how our actions are transforming people's lives on the ground. That's what government is for. That is what equity is about. That is what we're all here for. And on behalf of the president and the vice president, I am uh, incredibly grateful for all the work that you have done and will do. Thank you. Thank you.